I V M. Welcome to Police Chalky, a special limited series on your favorite public policy podcast, All Things Policy. This series will take you behind the khaki uniform, beyond the flashing red beacon, and into the heart of the functioning of the Indian police forces. We cast a critical eye on the role and function of the police in the Indian democracy, from the silent persistence of paperwork and meticulous investigation to risky counterterrorism efforts and policing in conflict zones. We explore the need for police reform and accountability in the system. Each episode brings you a comprehensive exploration of a unique facet of policing, illuminated by the insights of a former IPS officer who has lived the life behind the badge. So join us every Monday morning as we take you into the complex world of police chowki. Hello and welcome to Police Chowki. In today's episode, we take a deep dive into the workings of India's most well-known investigative agency, the Central Bureau of Investigation or CBI. We'll go over the role and function of the CBI, or the contentious issues around the misuse of CBI to target political opponents, or the conflict CBI raises with the federal structure of India, or the constitutionality of CBI or the lack of it as we will see, or why the public servants in India are afraid of the three C's as they call it, which are CBI, CVC and CAG, and many more such questions. CBI sits at the confluence where law enforcement, politics and the rule of law merge in our country. But as citizens, it is our duty to demand more accountability from our premier investigative agency. And talk about CBI and everything about it, I have my guest on the show, Mr. Javid Ahmed, who is a former IPS officer and has had the honour of serving as the Joint Director of the Central Bureau of Investigation. A warm welcome to you, Mr. Ahmed, to the show. Uh, good afternoon, Sri. It's a pleasure to be back. And yes, uh, I have had very long uh, association uh, with the CBI over a dozen years in various capacities. So it should be interesting talking about how CBI is, is from the inside and probably try to clear a few cobwebs about the perception that there is about the CBI in the public. So let's go. That's great. And I'm very excited to hear from you about, you know, the insider's look of CBI. So let's get started. And I want to begin by talking a little bit about the history of CBI, right? Uh, so CBI has its origin in something known as the Special Police Staff, which was in fact set up by the British government in 1941 during the World War II in order to investigate uh, cases of bribery and corruptions in the War and Supplies Department of India back. Later on in 1946, a law was brought in called the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act, uh, under which uh, the CBI functions even today. Before CBI was created, there was the SPE, like I mentioned. It had jurisdiction over all union territories of the India. And it could also conduct investigations in the states with the consent of the particular state government. CBI was actually created by an executive notification issued by the government of India in April 1963. It has been designated as the primary investigative agency under the Prevention of Corruption Act of 1989, which is to ensure that all acts of uh, corruption are investigated and prosecuted. Other than that, CBI has actually expanded its remit in the coming uh, in the later years. You know, it has looked at conventional cases of murder, kidnapping, terrorist and economic offences, other than its original role of for looking at anti-corruption offences. Apart from that, you have had a lot of High Court and Supreme Court decisions regularly, which has ordered CBI investigations in many cases, and this keeps happening. Uh, today, as it stands, I believe CBI has around three divisions, which is the anti-corruption, economic crimes, and the special crimes unit. So this is a short uh, history of the organization itself. Uh, but what I wanted to know from you, Mr. Ahmed, is, you know, as against the original role of CBI, which was envisaged to be an anti-corruption uh, investigative unit, I clearly see there has been a function creep. Uh, more and more offences are being investigated by CBI. Its remit has only expanded over the years. And today we have CBI investigations in all kinds of cases being ordered by the government and the high courts and the Supreme Court as well in many cases. So from your perspective, do you believe this function creep is affecting the operational effectiveness of the CBI? Or do you see uh, there are benefits to this? Or do you think there are risks associated with this? Thank you, uh, Sri. Since you started with a few sentences about the history of the CBI, let me add a little bit more about the history of the CBI. The CBI was set up during the war, which is correct. The first uh, office of the CBI was set up in Lahore, and the first gentleman who was first officer who was made in charge of the special unit, as it was called, was one Mr. Kurban Ali, who was an imperial police officer in unpartitioned India. Uh, about corruption, 
since CBI's job was essentially about corruption, let me quote Kautilya. He says, just as it is not possible not to taste honey or poison put on the surface of the tongue, so it is not possible for the government servants dealing with money not, not to taste it in however small a quantity. So, Chanakya, in all his wisdom, all those centuries ago, realized that government servant and corruption are probably interlinked in ways that is very difficult to untwine them. Thirdly, uh, another small nugget, that the first case that the CBI uh, registered after it was constituted was that the station officer of Lahore was arrested while taking a bribe of rupees one from a person for underweighing the cargo that he wanted to be shipped on the train. So, uh, these are the small nuggets that uh, I thought would be of interest to people. Trivia, but interesting trivia. Now, uh, you talked about a function creep. I would look at it slightly differently. You see, when the CBI was established, it was pre-partition India. It was colonial India. So, their role was limited. It, the, the role was came into being because of the war. There were a lot of supplies being purchased and sent across. And I suppose at that time, there was a need felt for ensuring that corruption does not happen, despite what Kotodia had said. Now, after independence, when a new republic came into being, government started expanding its operations. Things which the colonial government had not done were now being done by the republic for the welfare of the, of the country. A new system of governance was coming in. And corruption, obviously, was something that was high on the list of priorities of the government uh, that had come into being. Uh, in that context, committee known as the Santhanam Committee was set up. And uh, Mr. Santhanam, in his wisdom, recommended that the CBI should be given more shape, more clout, and more uh, you know jurisdiction so that the ever-expanding activities of the government and the government servants are within the ambit of the CBI. Now, uh, as time passed, economic activity became um, more prominent in various fields of our lives. Economic crimes started to happen, crimes that may not have been possible in the 40s and the 50s and the even in the 60s started happening. And therefore, the setting up the economic offenses wing became a necessity when huge frauds were taking place in terms of exports, imports, or other financial dealings. Should the Mehta episode, when the banking system was taken for a ride, the banking uh, division uh, was separated from the economic offenses division. So now, just to correct you, there are there is not only an economic offenses division, but also a banking and services and securities fraud division. So these are developments that took place, not necessarily because the central government wanted to quietly expand its presence, but because the changes that were happening in the social economic firmament had to be reflected uh, in the operational capability of the government of India to handle irregularities or criminalities that may emerge. The special crime division was something that was set up quite early. And in fact, in the early days when uh, terror activity started in India and India became a victim of that, it was the special crime division which took up the cases like the Bombay Blast case or the Indian Alliance uh, uh, hijacking case of Kandahar. So these were all, as developments happened on the social, economic and the geopolitical field, excuse me, uh, they, they, there was an expansion of the capacity, capability and jurisdiction uh, of the CBI. I would not, as an insider, call it a function creep. Right. I have just a couple of follow-ups to that. One is, uh, does CBI have enough resources to deal with the, all the offences which come under its remit of investigation? And second, just to understand the structure, I believe the CBI director uh, is appointed independently uh, in the sense uh, you have a committee of the Prime Minister, the Chief Justice of India and the Leader of Opposition who decide on his appointment. But the rank and file of CBI is drawn from different uh, police for, uh, under the Home Ministry. Uh, so, could you please go into a bit more detail into the staffing aspect as well? Yes, the appointment of the director CBI is a very unique exercise. Probably the only uh, such exercise in the whole country where the selection of the officer who will head the CBI is made by a committee which is headed by the Honorable Prime Minister of the country. 
it also has its as its member the chief justice of india and it also has the leader of opposition as its member so it's a three member committee and it's obviously a very high power committee this committee looks at the names of the of the possible candidates who are selected from the senior most four batches uh, of the ips these details about who is to be considered for appointment to cbi director etc are laid down very elaborately in the famous case called the Vinay Tarayan case which was adjudicated by the honorable supreme court and then laid down very clear cut guidelines about who is to be considered let me quickly add however that in the last at least two instances i can very clearly say that the principles laid down by in the Vinay Tarayan case have started getting diluted they stood the test of time for about 10 12 years and about five or maybe six directors got selected on the basis of the of the very strict reading of the vinay tarayan judgment but as happens in all things related to governance and uh, and politics we have seen you know fraying of the commitment to the principles enunciated in the vinay tarayan case in the last at least two instances of selection right and what about the cadre yes the cbi uh, comprises officers who are taken on deputation it also has a substantial number of officers who are uh, cbi insiders as they are called that is they are recruited for the cbi and they spend the pretty much their whole career in the cbi so there are two streams one is of the insider cbi officers and another stream of officers who come on deputation from state police organizations and this is uh, at the level of inspectors deputy superintendent of police dig joint director and director so there's a you know, regular coming and going of people from the states and this mix uh, we have seen over the years is very uh, useful and it brings new blood and new knowledge and new thoughts uh, to uh, to the working of the cbi because there are certain kinds of cases that happen only in the states for example special crime cases of murder or of terrorist act or whatever banking fraud etc these are things that are happening in the field uh, or in the you know up and down the country so the chances are that officers of the state cadres have dealt with these these cases in their career and when they come to the cbi they bring that knowledge and that experience to the cbi whereas the cbi cadre officers uh, have their own areas of expertise and uh, that if i may elaborate on it is a very good understanding of the anti corruption laws a very diligent uh, way of working uh, and a very good understanding of the procedure through which the trial is to be conducted after a charge sheet is filed so this mix officers uh, experience is something that has stood the test of time and i think the cbi is best served by this arrangement right and uh, you know since you mentioned the director appointment but Uh, it takes me back to this very infamous episode from the i think in the last few years uh when uh, between mr alok verma and mr rakesh astana which actually took a very ugly turn and turned very controversial a uh, dispute over the appointment of uh, cbi director but let's turn to another more contentious and perhaps more relevant issue for all us as democratic citizens right which is the political misuse of cbi and it's almost an accepted fact in our public domain that uh, investigative agencies are routinely used by those in the power to target political opponents uh, you know regardless of the party in power but there has been a growing trend of uh, rising this kind of uh, misuse of cbi ed and certain other agencies uh, so i would like to quote a recent study by indian express which looked at the cases registered by cbi under the upa government from 2004 to 2014 and the current nda government from 2014 onwards in the last 8 years so this as per the a uh, data available uh, by the indian express uh, 72 political leaders came under cbi scanner during the upa out of which 43 of them which is around 60% were from the opposition uh, while under the nda the difference is very stark out of the 124 uh, uh, political leaders who were target of cbi uh, investigation around 118 of them which is 95% were from the opposition now it's also almost a commonly accepted fact in our politics at least that you know once uh, you switch sides to another political party uh, the cases against you just disappear right uh, and also critics have questioned the timing of this raid because these raids by cbi or the investigation by cbi has been done at uh, politically convenient uh, times uh, and in fact the supreme court had called cbi a caged parrot a few years back 
and that has somehow stuck, right? Uh, and and from what you characterize the force as of upstanding officers of diligent investigation and prosecutorial practices, uh, this is rather uh, shameful for CBI to carry such a moniker. So, given uh, these statistics that I quoted and these recurring allegations which keep coming up, I want to know from you, uh, to what extent are these claims of misuse of CBI for political purposes valid in your experience? And has this affected the credibility and the impartiality of the organization overall? So, let me answer this in two parts. The first part is that while there are certain cases which have political ramifications and there are individuals involved who, are, who have political affiliations, and these are the cases that hog the limelight as far as the media is concerned, there are a whole lot of other cases which are non-political or which have no political undertones. And those cases are equally important as far as the CBI is concerned. And those cases are investigated in a most professional manner by uh, officers, uh, as I said, who have very high caliber. Coming back to the cases that are that involve political individuals, there are two things that I would like to say. One, most of these cases, at least till about 8-10 years ago, were cases that had been given to the CBI by various high courts and supreme courts. If you recall whether it was the Forrest scam case, which incidentally I investigated, or animal husbandry scam, or the Ayurved scam in Uttar Pradesh, which again I investigated, or other cases uh, relating to uh, politicians, I think a very large majority of these cases were handed over to the CBI by the High Court and the Supreme Court. So, uh, jump to the conclusion that all these cases were taken up by the CBI at the instance of the government would be factually incorrect. Unfortunately, in the last few years, the tendency of the CBI to take up cases on its own against political persons has gone up. I can only say as a former CBI officer and as a, as a former police officer that this trend is not good. It is not to be encouraged. I know that many officers within the CBI are very uncomfortable with it. But I also know that uh, they are investigating those cases and that they are taking up these cases in right earnest. What I really hope is that once these cases come to them, then they investigate the case on merit. That is that they do not unnecessarily implicate against whom there is no evidence or not sufficient evidence or they let off someone who against whom there is sufficient evidence. Uh, you mentioned about a, a, file, a case file getting uh, going into the cold storage. Yes, uh, the, this tendency has crept in. Uh, it was a rarity in the past. I will not say it did not exist, but it was a rarity in the past. The frequency of such cold storaging, uh, if I can use that term, has increased. And it is up to the CBI officers who are there presently and who come up in the future to fight this trend. Because if they do not fight this trend, then the long that the trust that the CBI has earned through the hard work of many who have passed through its portals as officers and as inspectors and as other ranks, their hard work would be undone. And that would be an injustice to all those who have retired from the CBI. Now, uh, since I have served in the CBI in various capacities, let me tell you that when I was joint director uh, in the 2009 to 2014 phase, there were at least two very senior central ministers who had to be removed from their positions of ministers to the government because of the CBI. This is very different from how things are now. As I said, I hope that the CBI is able to defend its past glory in a more resolute manner and the officers who are manning it now show that kind of professionalism. Right. And uh, one side, of course, like as you mentioned, there are high courts and supreme courts routinely order CBI inquiries uh, because of the nature of the case or the seriousness of the crime. Uh, the other thing is, of course, targeting the political opponents by uh, certain officers who want to prove they are more loyal than the king. And, you know, they uh, take uh, they are also probably incentivized by the system to take charge of such cases. But there might also be a lot of cases where a prosecution is hindered or uh, is not even started. Uh, because of political pressure, right? So, and I'm sure that won't even show up in any statistic. So, what is your take on that? You see, one area which has always been a grey area and a matter of great uh, uh, heartburn within the CBI is the delay in the 
sanction for prosecution uh, of cases after the in the investigation has been completed. As you know, the law requires that when any public servant, uh, whether he's a government official or someone who's been in a ministerial position or an MP or MLA or whatever, if he is to be uh, proceeded against, then before the matter is taken up by the courts, before the courts can start the trial, there's a legal requirement for prosecution sanction. Ideally, this prosecution sanction is to be given within three months, if not at maximum by within six months. And when the CBC or the Central Vigilance Commission reviews the cases of the CBI, then this is one of the important points on the agenda to, to see whether the government is you know, not delaying the, the issue of prosecution sanctions. This delay is more so in the case of government officials. And uh, the cases of political persons whose sanction is delayed is lesser in number. This is this may come as a surprise to to some, but government officials as much to be blamed for lobbying and running around and doing whatever they do and getting the sanction delayed uh, compared to uh, political persons. The system or the government machinery does not seem to have the capacity to decide the matter expeditiously. This is a matter of record and it's proven by you know, lived experience. And uh, this is definitely something that keeps the CBI and the Central Vigilance Commission agitated at most times. Right. I actually wanted to come to uh, this aspect of sanction for prosecution. And since you brought it up, uh, so the Prevention of Corruption Act, as well as certain provisions in the CRPC, require a sanction of the competent authority who can dismiss the official to give sanction before that particular official can be prosecuted for the offense. But like you mentioned, this uh, three-month term limit is only paid lip service to, sanctions get delayed, the CVC has to look into it, but at many cases, it does not even happen. But the usual counter-argument we hear uh, from the government, from the official side is, uh, the three C's, you know, the um, CBI, the Comptroller and Auditor General, or the CAG, and the CVC, the Central Vigilance Commission. Uh, the officials are almost afraid of these three C's uh, who will come after them for taking any policy decision, even taken in good faith, uh, and they could be uh, charged for crimes and prosecuted against, and their career could just end up in ruins. So there's a genuine apprehension among uh, certain public servants, uh, which is why this sanction for prosecution provision was brought back uh, in 2018 by the government. What do you make of uh, this argument? Is there merit to it or uh, is it something like if you have done um, no wrong, then fear that? I would not like to comment on any particular case uh, and that would not be fair. But tell me, is there a perception that the CBI has been able to proceed against everyone who was corrupt and uh, everyone who was corrupt has been brought to justice? Or is there a uh, perception that a lot of corrupt people have got away? If it is the latter... It means that despite the best intentions of the law and of the prosecuting agency, there are many who have been able to get away. And therefore, to say that the prosecution sanction is a essential thing and uh, that if without it, a lot of people who are otherwise innocent would be harassed, it does not hold. The prosecution sanction is something in law that is the, which is not contested by the CBI. The CBI is never an appeal against the concept of prosecution sanction. All it is, all it, that it has wanted is that it should be uh, disposed of in a timely manner. That I think is not something that is uh, unreasonable. And for certain groups of officials to say that they did not uh, do their work because they were scared of the CBI, the CPC, and the CAG. It, I think uh, it's an argument that I would have problems accepting. Because if the contention was that a lot of honest officers have been put behind bars because of the provisions of the law, then it would hold. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of corrupt people have not been put behind bars. The argument made by certain groups of officials that the law is very draconian uh, has to be tested against the lived experience of this country over the last 50, 60 years. The perception and the fact is that a lot of corrupt people have got away rather than that a lot of honest people have been put behind bars for doing what was correct. If that is so, then to say that the law is draconian does not stand empirical test. Had it been the other way around, maybe yes. But in the absence of 
such a thing and the presence of a lot of officers, government officials who have done wrong and got away with it. The, the bogey created that the CAG and the CVC and the CBI an overhang to decision making. I don't see merit in that. Stay tuned to All Things Policy. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Let's actually move on to another aspect of this uh, politicization of CBI, right? And that pertains to something known as the general consent, which is granted to the CBI by state governments to operate uh, in particular states. So, recently, a lot of states who perceive this misuse of CBI by the union government have been withdrawing this general consent uh, granted by them. Uh, so, we have Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, West Bengal, and even Tamil Nadu, which uh, earlier this month has revoked this general consent given to uh, the state. So, I have a two-part question on this. One is, how does this impact uh, CBI's job? Uh, how does it impact its uh, investigative functions uh, if the general consent is withdrawn by the state government? And the second is, obviously, this does not pertain uh, well for our federal structure because this shows a great amount of distrust between the state government and the union government uh, who are supposed to be united in fighting uh, crime or fighting uh, uh, economic offenses or even, you know, in tackling corruption. Uh, so what are your comments on that? You use the word distrust. The federal structure that we have in this country is at the same time a very robust structure, but also is very fragile in that small actions of the central government are liable to be misconstrued by the state governments and vice versa until such time as a particular level of trust exists between the central government and the state government. This whole federal structure, which is essential part of our governance structure and our legal constitutional structure, will come under strain. Having said that, when the CBI decides, and it has started doing so recently in more frequently than I'll be happy with, to register cases against political individuals or people with political affiliations, going over the head of the state government, then such apprehensions are bound to rise. And one of the weapons that the state governments then have against the CBI is that they withdraw the general consent, as it is called. General consent is a permission given under Section 6 of the SPE Act, the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act, whereby the CBI is allowed by the concerned state to operate in with regard to certain categories of government officials. Normally, it is officials who are working with the government of India and its PSUs and others, for example, banks and uh, public sector undertakings. By withdrawing the Section 6 consent, what happens is that if the CBI wants to take up a case, let us say in Tamil Nadu or in Himachal, who have not given the general consent, so the CBI will then have to go to the government in each of the cases, each of the matters in which it wants to register a case and seek the approval of the government to proceed. That approval may come, it may not come, it may take time and obviously uh, it will have repercussions on the uh, uh, speed at which action can be taken and that is obviously something that uh, is not desirable. So to answer your question about how what impact it has, it has an adverse impact. Why this is happening? I think this is one of the byproducts of the slightly, you know, contentious political environment that exists between states and the center presently. It is something that is beyond the hands of, uh, you know, any one of us uh, who are working in the CPI. And it is for the statesmen of this country to handle. Right. And uh, this actually brings me to the next question on the constitutional aspect of having a, a federal bureau nature of Central Bureau of Investigation in our country because the very fact that uh, the CBI needs a general consent from the state government to operate uh, actually takes us back to uh, the provision of the constitution uh, regarding law and public order which essentially is the state government's domain. So the union government does not have policing powers, the state governments do under the constitutional setup and the CBI being a special unit set up under a law of the parliament uh, requires uh, to take this general consent before operating. So, in this context, and I remember we had 
part of this discussion in one of our early episodes as well as to how the union government is slowly intruding into the territory of uh, state governments uh, across different domains be it health education and so on but also with respect to police uh, and this has particularly happened with the cbi and the national investigation agency which was uh, created after the 2008 attacks as far as the legal aspect of this is concerned in fact there is a decision of the gawati high court in 2013 which said that the constitution of cbi and the dsp act using a executive notification was unconstitutional which effectively said that the cbi cannot operate in the country right but this judgment has however been stayed by the supreme court and uh, we haven't heard much after that so this case is not progressed uh, as regards nia the chatisgarh government has filed a petition before the supreme court challenging the constitutionality of uh, the nia because it says the parliament does not have the powers to make laws on this aspect uh, so in your outlook so where does this whole idea of uh, having federal investigative agencies fall or uh, do you think it is a necessity which can be justified on certain other constitutional grounds or do you feel um, there is enough in our constitution which of course has a federal system with uh, which drifts in the favor of the union government do you think there is enough to justify having such an agency you see i, I was in the cbi when the gauhati high court passed that order and all, obviously there was absolute panic uh, in the cbi what is to be done i was in fact the person from the cbi who then uh, drafted the application on behalf of cbi and went to the supreme court and we got a stay order subsequently that matter has not been taken up now the fact that one uh, that the high court passed the order questioning the validity legal validity of the executive order and second thing the fact that it was very quickly in one hearing stayed by the honorable supreme court and also the fact that subsequently nothing has been done in it in fact tells the whole story of how contentious this matter is and how fragile the whole structure of federalism is in the in our constitutional scheme of things while the necessity and the need for an agency like this which has pan india scope for fight for fighting corruption or for fighting economic crimes or for fighting banking sector frauds or for fighting uh, or for investigating crimes that have all their uh, implications is felt and it is a modern world where uh, there are no uh, geographical boundaries even across nations to limit the police to one state will have implications which are really obvious on the other hand the concern of the courts to see that the state's rights are not encroached and the federal structure is not injured beyond a particular point i mean these are all very clear cut indications that indian jurisprudence is yet to find a formula which will accommodate the need and the existence and the legal position of an agency like the cbi the requirement of the cbi is obvious the legal basis for that is something that indian jurisprudence seems to be still struggling to find and i am sure with time these things will happen i don't see how an agency like the cpi can be done away with but uh, the correct legal framework will come out from the minds of jurists who will be manning the supreme court or who man supreme court presently right and because it's it's really surprising to me because we have this premier investigative agency which obviously plays a very important role in the nation's affairs and yet it does not stand on sound or legal footing uh but moving on to a little bit on the accountability front for cbi because of course there is the angle of misuse or uh, the vinith narayan case they tried to correct a lot of things one of the things uh, did was ensuring certain independence in the appointment of cbi director i don't know how much of that has translated to the cbi director functioning independently but uh, that's a separate story and maybe you could shed some light uh, the other aspect was of course uh, bringing cbi under the purview of uh, central vigilance commission or the cvc uh since 2003 when uh, amendment to this effect was passed by the parliament uh the idea is that uh, cvc will exercise superintendence powers of cbi in a regular manner and it will ensure that uh, the agency is not misused or uh, there is some extern extra layer of oversight and accountability i want to know from you as the cvc setup really worked well is the cbi better off today because of this superintendence do you think uh, there is more that requires to be done and there is a way which uh, uh we can use to achieve those objectives so uh, the cvc's role was on two fronts one was in the selection of officers of the rank of uh, sp and above 
for serving in the CBI. The process was uh, that was followed or is followed even now is that the CBI does a, a due diligence and identifies police officers uh, of the rank of SP and above who are interested in joining the CBI and then a due diligence is done to see whether they are suitable for the CBI in terms of their professional capacity, capability, and also their integrity and commitment to rule of law in such, such matters. Let me add here that many officers, and I, I emphasize the word many officers who wanted to join the CBI did not pass this test and could not make it to the CBI. Uh, let me add that I was the person for, for about three years who was doing this work. And there was there were many officers who kind of got did not make the first cut. Now, once the uh, CBI has made its short list, the list is then uh, put up before the CVC, and the CVC then uh, conducts a meeting to understand why we are wanting to select a particular person. And I think it this the system worked very well. We had to convince the CVC that. The selection that we have made uh, is the best that is available and that no extraneous factors have come in, etc. And um, uh, till 2014-15, uh, I can say, about which I know, subsequently I have been, I have not had any first-hand experience, that the system worked very well. There were uh, a few objections raised by the CVC once in a while and that, and it was taken in good spirit and in, uh, in the stride by the CBI. And we got good officers. So that is one area that the CBC worked as a buffer for the CBI in, in selecting good uh, officers for to man their senior ranks. The other area where the CBC was monitoring and superintending was in the progress of the cases of, of the anti-corruption division. I would like to emphasize that they were only monitoring the progress of the case. They were not into supervising the actual investigation of the case. That again was a process which was helpful for, to the CBI because there were many issues wherein the government's uh, delay or the government's recalcitrance in uh, making available documents, etc. was resolved because of the intervention of the CBI. So it was working very well till then. Sorry to say that subsequently the CBC has given up on some of its uh, duties in terms of pursuing matters with the government or of acting as a cushion when uh, there are pulls and pressures for the induction of a particular officer into the CBI. The overall decline in the accountability of various institutions has hit the CVC as well, it would seem. Right. Uh, so, one final question to you uh, before we close the chat today. We are, of course, uh, on police chalky and our primary focus remains our uh, Indian police services. Although today we took a detour to talk about the CBI. But since you have served in both, uh, in the CBI for a long time and in the police, I believe, for a longer duration, uh, what do you think are the takeaways in terms of uh, policy measures that, uh, you know, maybe our state forces can adopt uh, from the CBI? And what are the lessons uh, that the CBI can give uh, to our state police to make it better? The first thing that the state police needs to uh, adopt from the CBI is the capacity to investigate complicated cases of various types, uh, whether it is of traditional crimes like a murder uh, or a kidnapping, or of cybercrime, which is increasingly becoming a problem for everyone, or banking fraud cases, where banks and other financial institutions are, are being duped by unscrupulous elements, or anti-corruption cases, which are happening uh, even at the state level, obviously, the CBI can handle only a limited number of cases of any type. It's a very small organization of about 8,000 people, starting from the director to the lowest level. And uh, they cannot handle all the cases that come to them or the cases that happen across the length and breadth of our country. So using the SOPs developed by the CBI, asking the CBI to train people in the state police forces is something that should happen. Uh, and it should be it should be uh, it should become a routine exercise of upskilling uh, the state police forces. The other area where the CBI can assist the state police forces is is in training of their various ranks in not only investigation but in forensic capabilities. Thankfully, this is uh, this has started to happen uh, because the CBI has much better forensic capabilities than the state police forces. Uh, so that that is another area that the CBI can chip in. 
Uh, and thirdly, I would say uh, cases where evidence is to be collected from across the international borders. Once again, the CBI's capabilities are robust and time-tested, and that is one area they can, the, they, they can help the state police forces with. Uh, I may quickly add that the CBI is in the Interpol for India. Uh, the CBI, India's uh, Interpol office, and the Interpol in Lyon, France, interacts uh, with CBI uh, for all matters. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this chat today, Mr. Ahmed, and looking forward to have you more on Police Shoki. Thank you. Thank you, Shri. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.